First John 5 and verse 13. You've been somewhere for so many months, you know, week after week after week. And it's almost hard to leave there. And that's where I'm at this morning. And so we're going to read 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 to 21, and that's going to be the end of the book. And it starts with a verse that I quote often, especially when giving an invitation. And it's, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. And if any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that. He shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. And we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Amen. The epistle in this particular text is written for all of those who believe in the name of the Son of God. This is not a letter to everybody. This is not a letter to the world at large. Specifically, it's a letter to those who are called to be saints, to those who are born again, regardless of their age. If they're born again, it's addressed to them, but it's not addressed to everyone simply because it would be preposterous for John to offer assurance of salvation to people who aren't saved. John would never wish that a man who had not believed in Jesus should think that he had eternal life because there's no salvation outside of Jesus. And so these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. There are actually a lot of Christian people, and I'm talking born-again people, people who believe the gospel, people who are saved. They don't know that they possess eternal life. Many of them are Pentecostals, Assembly of God people, Wesleyan people, so-called free will Baptist people. And you say, why so-called? Because the whole things that distinguish free will Baptist is free will Baptist is so contrary to the rest of Baptist theology that it's, it's like an oxymoron. Free will Baptist, it's an oxymoron. But anyways, that's a whole nother sermon. But these People, Christian people, they believe the gospel. They've been born again. The Holy Spirit lives within them, and yet they have no assurance of their salvation. And I'm going to guess that there were people just like that in John's day. And so he says, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that she may know that you have eternal life. In other words, so you don't have to wonder about it or hope for it. Or question it. You can know. You can be 100% for sure that you have eternal life. And by the way, do you want to know who struggles with their salvation? Are people who are hung up on their own free will. Calvinists never question their salvation. You say, well, why not? Because free will requires that you have a part in your salvation. And so you're always doubting if you're doing enough. But to the Calvinist, to the person who believes in sovereign election, it's all God. And there's never any reason to doubt God. You see, the, the doubt is not in their ability to trust Jesus. It's their inability to trust themselves. And by the way, they do well not to trust themselves. I'll say this. If I could have lost my salvation, I would have already done it. But these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. God gave it to you. 
And so you can rest in that. There's nothing you can do to screw it up. Because you didn't, you didn't earn it. You didn't do anything for it to begin with. Notice the present tense. That you may know that you have eternal life. Most commentaries, when they comment on this passage, and most preachers of old who've left printed sermons on the text, they speak as though the passage says that she may know that you shall have eternal life. But we have eternal life right now. The spiritual life that is in us at this moment is the same life that we'll be living in heaven. The grace life on earth is the glory life in heaven. They're the same life. The only difference is, is that life's a little less developed right now. But even now, the Bible says we're being conformed to the image of his son. In heaven, we'll have been completely sanctified. We'll have been completely transformed into that image. But even now, God is sanctifying us and we're growing in that direction. And so verses 14 and 15 say, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. And so having assurance of our salvation, having assurance that we have spiritual life, we have assurance when we pray. The Apostle Paul said the same thing in Romans chapter 8. He said, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And so because I'm confident of my standing in place in Jesus, I am confident that when I pray, my prayer is heard and I can pray expecting an answer. I can pray looking for an answer. If you're praying and not expecting an answer, you're not really praying. At best, you're playing with prayer. Think of it this way. If I'm with a friend and I ask him a favor and he's just about to reply to me and I turn away and open the door and leave and go about doing whatever else I need to do that day, that would be an insult. But when you pray, not expecting an answer, you're doing the same thing to God. When you pray, do so expecting an answer. That's the difference between genuine prayer and prayer that is but a formality. Look at verse 16. If any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I did not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And so we see our brother, we see our sister, we see them sin. What do we do? We run all over the place and we tell everybody else about it. No, that's not what we do. That's what I see happen quite a bit, but that's not what we're supposed to do. But we do tell the Lord about it. And we pray for them and we ask the father to forgive his fallen child and, and to help them. But there's a sin unto death, an unpardonable sin, if you will. And some Christians, especially, like I said, those who were more into the free will, Pentecostal, Wesleyan traditions, those who believe they can lose their salvation, those who believe that they might have played some part in their, you know, salvation or in the keeping of it, they sometimes fear that they've committed the sin that leads to death. But when you've committed the sin that leads to death, you have no desire for forgiveness. You'll never repent. You'll never seek faith in Christ. You'll continue hardened and unbelieving. You'll never be subject to holy influences because you've crossed over into this dark region where hope and mercy never come. In Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul describes that person saying that they have a reprobate mind. So if you think you've committed the unpardonable sin and you're grieving over it and you're worried about it, that alone is the clear evidence that you did not commit the unpardonable sin. 
Because if you had, you wouldn't be grieving over it and you wouldn't be worrying about it and you wouldn't be concerned about it. In fact, even your fear is a sign of life. And so whoever repents of their sin and trust in Jesus is freely and fully forgiven. And so it's clear that they've not committed the sin that would lead to death, the sin that could not be forgiven. And there's a lot to the passage to make us prayerful and watchful. But there's nothing there to make us despair, to make us fear. He who is born again is born from above. He can not commit the unpardonable sin. He's literally kept from it. Look at verse 18. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Also remember this, the new nature is incapable of sinning. The old nature remains and can still sin. And the old nature sins by its very nature. But the new nature doesn't sin because it's fathered of God. And so the born again is preserved by the sovereign grace of God himself so that even when the old nature does what it is prone to do, the child of God can be confident. Because the promise here is that the old nature one day will die. Even now, even as the old nature from time to time is sinning, it's dying. And the new nature is going to live forever. Look at verse 19. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. In other words, we're so one with Christ that while the head lives, the members cannot die. And so it's from our fellowship with Jesus that we find a higher state of absolute certainty regarding not only our salvation, but other truths as well. Look at verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and have given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. We know the facts of the gospel. And while others of our fellow creatures are unaware of the first principles of faith, scarcely some of them maybe not even knowing that there's a God altogether. Many of them ignorant of the plan of redemption of, of the Lord and his blood. We live in a so-called Christian country, and yet there's a lot of ignorance about these things. In fact, I got to thinking about it. There is no book less read in proportion to its circulation than the Bible. Do you realize that the King James Bible is the best-selling book in the history of the world? But how many people read it? Most people have a Bible. But again, how many of them have read it? And certainly no book is less understood. And so we should actually make a regular point to question others about what they know of Christ. In many churches, I'll just say it politely, the preaching is not so good. But yet in a lot of churches, the preaching is fundamentally solid, and yet there's still ignorance of the basic truths of the gospel. 140 years ago, Spurgeon lamented that the language that was used in the pulpits was not understood by most people, that the preacher, he said, was somewhere up in the clouds and the people learned nothing from big words, but yet they suppose it's all right and they listen to it. But as far as instruction was concerned, he said the preacher might almost as well have been speaking in Syriac. But it's a happy thing to know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has come in the flesh and that he took upon himself the sins of the people, that he bore the wrath of God on our behalf and that by believing in him we're justified. The people who wanted to be the people of God for generations could not be justified by the law of Moses, but we can be justified by the blood of Christ. Ephesians 1.7 says we have redemption through his blood and sanctification and eternal life. And we have the Holy Ghost living within us and he converts the soul and comforts and illuminates and guides and sanctifies. And so we know that we have a future life. And it's good to know that we have a future life and it's good to know that the Holy Spirit lives within us. It's good to know that Jesus died for us. It's good to know of the doctrine of election and the doctrine of effectual calling and the doctrine of eternal security. And yet there are many that haven't found those truths out yet. 
And that's why John wrote this letter, because as I said, there are Christians who they believe the gospel, they've been saved, they've been born again, but yet they still don't have assurance of their salvation. Why? Because somewhere after the gospel, there was false doctrine. If we found these great doctrinal truths that enable us to have assurance of our salvation, it's not a thing to boast of, but rather it is a thing to be thankful for. Verse 20 says, and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. No one knows the true God in the real sense of knowledge except through the Lord Jesus Christ. For no one, John 14, 6 says, comes to the Father except by the Son. And so verse 20 says, we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. There's nothing like life in Christ in fact, life in heaven is only life in Christ. If Jesus were not there, there would be no life in heaven itself. It would not be eternal life to know Jesus if he were not God. You know, some say that, well, he was just a good man. He was just a good teacher, but he wasn't God. But if he was but a mere man, how could he give us eternal life? Jesus is God himself. And so being in Jesus, I'm in God and I'm with God and God is with me. But then John very abruptly ends with a very strange ending. In verse 21, he says, little children, keep yourself from idols. You know, the Apostle Paul would often read off the list of people who were a blessing to him or who he was praying for, or who he was trying to encourage. But John just says, Little children, keep yourself from idols. Amen. John is not literally writing to little children, nor is he referring to childish or immature believers, but he's calling everybody who reads the epistle little children. And as we read in previous weeks, John uses the salutation more than a few times in the epistle. And it's a title of deep affection. The title Little Children also indicates the humility of those who are rightly called by that name because a little child isn't proud. He doesn't meddle with high things. He's content to sit at his father's feet or lie in his mother's bosom. And Christians being born again, born from above, become like little children. Otherwise, Jesus said they couldn't enter the kingdom of heaven. They were very great people once, maybe, but now they're very little not only that, the title also denotes teachableness. A little child goes to school. He learns his letters. You can't get older men to do that, especially in spiritual things. They're just crusted over with prejudice. They think they know it all. But truly, blessed is the man who's a little child in relation to God. Little children also have faith. Jesus said it would better that a millstone were cast upon your neck and you were cast into the ocean than that you offend the faith of a little one. Little children have a beautiful faith, especially when the word of their father is concerned. And so we should be little children of that sort towards God, unquestionably believing whatever he says to us and not asking how or why, just believing it. Not only that, but little children implies weakness. Little children are apt to be led astray, and so are we. God's people in John's day were surrounded by idolaters, and he feared that they may be swayed by their example. And we, too, are surrounded by idolaters. Although maybe they're not physical idols. But I don't think Paul or John rather was speaking of physical idols here. No doubt his fellow believers would have abhorred physical idols as much as he did. So when he said, keep yourself from idols, I think he was warning of hidden or unseen idols. Indulgences that lead to a life of fleshly license, cults of personality. You know, most churches fall into that trap. Independent Baptist churches, you have a cult of personality around the pastor. Southern Baptist churches, you have a cult of personality that, that centers around deacons or trustees or a group of controlling old rich ladies or something. But, but most churches have a cult of personality that everything revolves around. Pride and arrogance can become idols. The danger of fashioning a God in our own mind that will, you know, overlook our sin or whatever it is that, that we're okay with that God's not. Or worse, we worship ourselves, our clothes, our appearance, our, our possessions. 
where the idolatry of John's day was out in the open. They had statues to Mercury and Venus and, and Zeus. Idolatry in our day is a little more subtle. It's, we'll call it materialism. Yep. Our possessions become idols if we're not careful. Getting money seems to be the main purpose of too many lives. And so some people worship pursuits that are not bad in and of themselves. Your occupation, whatever it may be, probably is not bad in, in and of itself. Football, baseball, basketball, soccer, they're not bad things in and of themselves. Maybe soccer is, I don't know. But, uh, but they're not bad things in and of themselves. But, but our pursuits, again, can become an idol if we're not careful. You know, music is not a, is not a bad thing. The arts, the sciences, they're not bad things in and of themselves. But again, our pursuits can become idols if we're not careful. What did Jesus say in Matthew 22? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Some people make idols of their dearest relatives and friends. Some people make idols of their children and grandchildren. But we can have full assurance of our salvation and the child of God can know that God is his father and never have to question in his heart as to his sonship. To know that you have eternal life. That's the whole reason that God gave us the Bible. John 20 and verse 31. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you may have life in his name. So use the Bible to its proper end. And from it draw assurance of salvation. Believe that God answers prayer. Because we have the promise that he will do so. Pray expecting an answer and guard yourself from idols. No child of God would dare to worship a picture or an image or anything that is visible. But keep yourself from all of the other idols. The idols of your brain, from your creeds, idols of your own making, thoughts of your own imagination. Letting anything other than God rule you. Keep yourself pure from the love of fame. Do not make a God of yourself or of your family, or of your children. And then there's the ever-changing idols of the day. It may be intellectualism, or culture, or modern thought, or social justice, or whatever name it bears this week. But they all distract us from Jesus. If you look outside, actually look at that window there, you'll see that the trees are green and they have leaves. Amen. Last year, those trees didn't have leaves. You say, well, why not? Because vines and ivy were growing up and we were just choking them to death. This winter, I cut the vines. Some of them are still hanging in the tree because, but, but they're, they're cut down at the ground so that they're no longer tapped into their roots. And so those parasite plants are no longer sucking the life out of the trees. And guess what? Yep. They're coming to life. And so we got to cut out the clutter. That's what John meant when he said, keep yourself from idols. Amen. Tear down the ivy in your life and whatever is sucking the spiritual life out of you, just cut it out. I know as for myself, I just plan on just continuing to preach an old fashioned gospel. And if you'll stand in the old paths and follow together with God's help, we will see victory. And so, Father, I thank you for the fact that we can have assurance of our salvation, assurance as we pray, assurance that we have life with you. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would keep ourselves from anything that would be a hindrance to the enjoyment of that life. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that we would be a people who lives for and honors and glorifies you. Pray that you would bless our food and fellowship. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.